everyone. I'm Polly Dawkins, Executive Director of the Davis Finney Foundation for Parkinson's. And I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Carl Kieberts to our discussion today. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Nice to be here. Let's start off by introducing you to our community. Can you tell us who you are and a little bit about what you've done in your career? Sure, sure. So I, I uh, spent most of my professional career at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, on the faculty of the medical school, uh, where I worked as a neurologist, um, seeing patients with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, and also was involved in a lot of clinical research mostly clinical trials, but also observational studies in Parkinson's disease. Um, I got interested in neurological things in college. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to Amherst College and got a degree in neuroscience, which at that time, many moons ago, was an unusual undergraduate degree. Very unusual. And uh, I got probably interested in Parkinson's disease and therapeutics early in my life. When I was in high school, um, my grandfather had post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease. So he had um, Spanish influenza after World War I and uh, had encephalitis and had the sort of awakenings type Parkinson's disease. And um, I saw him get levodopa for the first time when he had relatively advanced Parkinson's disease and saw how potent therapeutics could be for the illness. Uh, so that really prompted me as an adolescent to be curious about the disease and about developing treatments for it. And that's pretty much what I've done for the rest of my life. Thank you for spending your time in this community and being so invested in a cause that we all care a lot about. Yeah. Well, we are here today to talk about a, a clinical trial that's going on and a, an exciting potential um, therapy that might be available. Um, and it's being called today uh, CVN424. And who knows why those names come, they come up with those names, but let's, let's talk about a little bit about it. What is it? And um, yeah, first of all, yeah, what is it? Yeah. So it's uh, CVN424 refers to this drug, um, which is a molecule, which has a particular action. It inhibits an enzyme, a, a receptor um, mm -hmm. that lives on uh, neuronal cells, nerve cells that live in a very particular part of the brain. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the name of this receptor is GPR6, which doesn't really mean anything either. <laughs> Letters and letters and numbers, um, uh, but it's it's a really interesting story. The company, Saravance, which makes this CVN424, has a philosophy about how they find new drugs, mm -hmm. and they look for what in the business are called targets, in this case, this receptor, that live only in certain parts of the brain. The idea being, if you can go after a target, this receptor, that is restricted in its distribution, so it isn't everywhere, it's only in certain places, then when you influence that receptor, you might have a very focused effect. Whereas if you do something to inhibit or stimulate something that it's expressed in a lot of the body, you might have beneficial effects, but you might have unexpected untoward effects, mm. side effects. The, their idea is to go after targets that are in restricted or localized expression. And this target, this GPR6, this receptor, lives in a very specific part of the brain. Um, and so the hope is that its effects will be very targeted on Parkinson's disease. And, and how was that discovered? Um the company has an unusual approach. Um, they have accumulated over 10,000 brain samples wow. of people with Parkinson's, without Parkinson's, with other illnesses, and those who died um, with no known illnesses from six to 102. So mm -hmm. uh, human brains, 10,000 human brain samples across the spectrum of illness and health and across the spectrum of ages 
-hmm. And they develop this technique by where they can um, sort the nuclei of the brain cells uh, and figure out the specific locations of those brain cells, the type of brain cells, and then the specific locations of those brain cells and what genes they are and are not expressing. It's Don't ask me to say more because it almost <laughs> sounds like science fiction to me. Right, right. Specific, but, but for example, here, this target, this GPR6, only is expressed by a, a class of nerve cells that are called medium spiny neurons. And these medium sp spiny neurons live in a part of the brain called the striatum. That's important in Parkinson's disease because the nerve cells that live in the substantia nigra, the dopamine containing nerve cells, project from the substantia nigra to the striatum. That's why it's called the nigro striatal pathway. And it's that dopaminergic nigro striatal pathway that degenerates in Parkinson's disease. It degenerates in all of us, but it degenerates faster than usual in Parkinson's disease. But it, it doesn't exist in isolation. That nigrostriatal pathway, which projects from kind of the back of the brain to the middle of the brain, then there's a whole circuit that that dopaminergic pathway interacts with. Mm -hmm. And it starts in the striatum, and then it also goes to this other part of the brain called the pallidum, and there's another thing called the subthalamic nucleus. I only use those names because people may have heard of them because that's, for example, the targets of deep brain stimulation can either be the pallidum or the subthalamic nucleus. But it just it, it's part of a circuit in the basal ganglia, this part of the brain that control contains the striatum and the pallidum. Mm -hmm. uh, so this GPR6 lives on this very specific nerve cell, medium spiny neurons, in the striatum. Beyond even that, there's there's two pathways that come out of the striatum in, involving medium spiny neurons. One's called the direct pathway, the other's called the indirect pathway. And it turns out this GPR6 is only on the indirect pathway, uh, medium spiny neurons. So it's very specific location in the brain and a very specific set of neurons. Um, so that's hopeful for this idea that you could be very targeted in its effect. And so the, the doses that are used of 424 very strongly inhibit that receptor. Super. Let's come back to that mm -hmm. a little bit further in, in the conversation, this, sure. this concept sure. of the direct and indirect pathways and that why that's important yeah. in Parkinson's. Um, so this the CBN four two four, is it is the hope it's going to be disease modifying or symptom symptom relief? Well, uh, its immediate intent is for symptom relief. Um, I'll, I'll just say though I'm, I'm a little leery of this distinction of symptom management and disease modification okay. because. Managing symptoms does change the clinical course. You know, like levodopa is not quote unquote neuroprotective, um, but it certainly alters the course of illness. And, and drugs that modify symptoms, of course, modify the clinical progression in some way. But 424 does not get at an underlying disease mechanism. It doesn't treat the neurodegeneration. It's not its intent. Its intent is to improve the signaling within the brain which leads to a reduction in symptoms. Might have other effects too, but that's the primary intent. Make people better now, not necessarily make people less worse later. So. Okay, that's helpful, that's helpful. So up until this time point that we're gonna talk about the trial in, in humans, um, what, what research has already been conducted to get CBN 424 to this point? I'd say there's been sort of three categories of things that have been done. So the, the, the molecule has been studied in animal models, mostly mice and rats, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the effect on inducing 
things that look like Parkinson's features. So you do things to rats that make them move more slowly or be less interested in things, and then look at the effects of 424 on that. And those effects were as expected and anticipated that it helps movement and also has these other generally called non-motor effects of sort of increased interest, reversal of things like apathy or lo loss of interest in your surroundings. So that's been done in animals and that was considered quite positive. And there's been studies in healthy people, so-called healthy volunteer studies, part of normal drug development, giving people a single dose and then a short period of medicine to look at safety essentially, because you're not mm -hmm. looking to see if there's any effect because those people don't have Parkinson's disease. And then there's been a, a study in Parkinson's disease uh, Parkinson's disease patients who are already on levodopa and have already developed what we call motor complications, they have wearing off of benefit and dyskinesias. And that was a relatively sizable phase two study, about 45 people in each of three arms, placebo and two doses of 424. And uh, they're the primary measure, as is often the case in people who have motor fluctuations is looking at reduction of off time. And 424 had a benefit there on off time. So all those lines of evidence so far suggest that this very novel approach, this inhibiting this receptor on the indirect pathway, medium spiny neurons, seems to improve the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Animal models and in this first study, in people with motor fluctuation. Super. So this new, this next phase of the studies or studies that, that we're going to talk about um, will be a monotherapy trial, correct? Right. Could right. you, I think I understand those words, but would you describe what, what does monotherapy mean for our community? Sure. So um, of course, Parkinson's disease, virtually everyone eventually will need and start on levodopa. Mm -hmm. They may start, that may be the first medicine they take, um, or it may be a, a, a later medicine they take. Sometimes people start on what are called dopamine agonists, um, like Pramipexol or Rapinerol, mm -hmm. or they may start on an MAOB inhibitor like uh, Risagiline or Azelaine. But everybody eventually requires dopaminergic medication to treat their signs and symptoms. And good news is those medicines work very well, at least initially, and can really improve the signs and symptoms. And some drugs are tested in add-on to those medicines. We use the term adjunctive. And the study I just talked about, people were on levodopa and had already developed motor fluctuations. But people have a time period where they're diagnosed and know they have Parkinson's disease before they start those medicines. Mm -hmm. We call that early untreated met Parkinson's disease because they haven't started on things like dopamine agonists or levodopa. And when drugs are treat tested in that environment, people who are diagnosed but not yet treated with dopaminergic medications, we call that monotherapy as opposed to adjunctive therapy later on. And the study that's currently ongoing is in people who fit in that category, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, they have the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but those signs and symptoms, those features are mild enough that they have not yet started on um, potent therapy. And those are the people who could participate in this trial. If somebody had been on uh, dopaminergic therapy or on levodopa and came off to go on, it, would it be possible for them to qualify to go on this trial or no? Um, if, if it was very brief exposure, um, possibly, but if they'd been treated for some time and wanted to come off in order to go into the study, that wouldn't be, um, the, the right person. Okay. Super. So what is this, this new phase of the trial measuring? Yeah. So in the study I talked about, I mentioned reducing off time and, mm -hmm. and that we measure by using diaries that patients have to fill out every day 
or not every day, but for a, a full day, a couple times before each visit. But in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, we don't recognize such clear motor fluctuations. And instead we have examinations and questionnaires we use. People might've heard of the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale or so-called UPDRS. And if they don't recognize the name, they might recognize some of the questions or things that people do in the office. Um, the one part of it is an exam that many people will be familiar with being asked to do things like tap their fingers or open and close their fist, walk certain ways, stand. Um, the clinician may pull them backwards. So that's part of the exam. <clears throat> but there's also a uh, self-report about how the features of Parkinson's disease interfere with everyday life, with dressing, eating, speaking, interacting. Uh, and that's that's not an exam. That's something that people just fill out. So that, that's part two of the UPDRS. Part three is the exam. So the main outcome measure in this study is that UPDRS scale. Um, but there's a, a number of other things that are being looked at too, but that's a very classic way of measuring the severity of Parkinsonian features in early untreated Parkinson's disease. So is there anything else about how the, well, let, let's talk about how the trial itself is structured. Mm -hmm. So it's a relatively small study. It's um, 60 people. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get, they'll either get the active drug or placebo. Um, placebo control is really important, especially in early Parkinson's disease because the things we see change may be rather modest. Um, and it's the best way of identifying those changes with any certainty. So half get active, half get placebo. And then it's uh, take that for three months. And there's visits, there's more visits early on, but roughly about once a month through those three months. Um, and those examinations are done over time, the UPDRS exams. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's these other uh, measures that I alluded to that are also done. Some of those done in the home, some of those done remotely. It, it, your audience may be familiar that there's a lot of development of technology around Parkinson's disease, you know, the iPhones and Apple watches and lots of technology that could be used to measure some of the more subtle signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So um, part of this study is to um, use a device that measures activity around the home and look at walking speed and so forth, so-called Emerald device, which doesn't require anything on the part of the person except for installation of it. It just measures that person's activities during the trial um, and is able to differentiate the person of interest from other people in the home, which is pretty amazing technology. Um, then there's another part that's like this, uh, in, uh, kind of video uh, th via the computer, which measures people's speech and their facial movements and also records what's bothering them the most about Parkinson's disease through a orchestrated interview. And then there's some cognitive testing, sort of puzzles and problems and following instructions, uh, which again is done via the computer rather than with a human interaction. And um, then there's a portable EEG-like thing, a, a band where a few nights that actually records your brain waves during sleep. Um, so a lot of interesting technology here, yeah. trying to understand all the effects. This is a very novel mechanism all the effects on both the motor and non-motor features that we would be interested in Parkinson's disease. So it's a fairly, it's a fair amount of work for participants and their families too, because there's all these things beyond just going to the visits, there's things they're doing at home as well. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about who is eligible to participate in a trial like this. And you mentioned that uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's, not on levodopa, Anything else that we should know if people are interested? 
to help them understand whether they might be eligible? Uh, I think those are the, the, the main things. Um, as I just alluded to, there's a lot involved in participation. There's a lot involved in participation in research at any time. Um, as people who have done so know, it you know requires a lot on the part of the participant and on the part of the investigators, but it's a real team effort. Mm. Um, and so being up for that team effort, three week, a three months duration of activity, and that there's these things you have to do at home as well. Um, so feeling uh, committed for that level of activity. I think that's that's an important thing. And feeling like interacting with technology is something that you're comfortable with or could get comfortable with if it's not something you do. Um, people have a lot of other serious illnesses. Um, they're coping with like cancer diagnosis or recent serious heart disease. Again, um, that would probably not be uh, the right person okay. for this study. Again, it's a relatively early study, what we call phase two. Mm -hmm. So people should generally be healthy because we don't fully understand all the safety aspects. It looks like a very safe drug so far, but um, you, we don't know that fully yet. Okay. So another feature of participation might have to be if you're close to a, uh, where the trial is being conducted. Yeah, because, because there's sites in a traditional site-based research, it's not virtual. There are some Parkinson's studies where you can do everything from home. This is not one of them. It's too early in the drug development to permit that kind of thing. And so but, where, if our audience is thinking about this, where in the U.S. Would so there's... They're pretty distributed. Um, there are sites that are open now, um, Florida, Texas, Colorado, Tennessee, Kansas, Arizona, Michigan. Um, I think those are the main ones that are open. There's going to be more, but they're okay. still just opening up as that we get into the new year. But um, so they're pretty distributed across the the country. There will eventually be uh, sites in Georgia, Wisconsin, Alabama, Minnesota, Oregon, Seattle, Virginia. Sounds like um, quite quite a few places. Yeah, no, it's a pretty distributed um, site list. So if somebody were listening to this and were interested, how do they find out more? How do, Where do they go to see where the trial sites are and how to raise their hand for this trial? Well, um, one of those is to the um, clinicaltrials.gov is kind of a, you know, standard source of information. Um, the Saravance website also has more information okay. about that. And we can um, link to that. Yeah. Um, and even just coming back to the Davis Finney Foundation and then eventually to me, I can try to help people get directed to the right place, but um, raising your hand is a great thing. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, research part, having been involved in research for basically all my professional life, it's, it's a very rewarding mm -hmm. thing for the team. It is a team effort uh, between those who, who we call participants and those who we call investigators, but we're really a team. Um, so it's really fun to do. It's not for everybody, obviously. Um, there are risks involved. There are burdens involved uh, described. You know, it's effortful. It's not the same as going to see your doctor. It's participating in research. Um, but it's really fun. You know, it's really, in my experience, in Parkinson's disease, it has not been particularly risky it, for everything involving stuff like gene therapy and deep brain stimulation and some things that are very invasive, a, a fairly simple study like this, which is taking a pill has been quite safe. And we've really developed some remarkable drugs over the last 30 years, a lot of things yet to do, <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of room to cover to make things better, but research is the way it happens. So when people feel like they're interested in that, it's a really tremendous thing. And I can imagine that the, the some of the benefits 
in addition to feeling like you're part of a solution, you're part of the future treatment for this Parkinson's community. But another benefit I would imagine is you get to see your movement disorder neurologist more often in that three month time. Is that is that accurate? Yes, it is for sure. You, you're a little bit more under a microscope, so to speak. You're a little bit more closely observed because um, it is research and we're looking for the good things as well as potential bad things that might come from the, the product. Um, so you, you're looked at a lot more carefully. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my patients over time did participate in research. Um, those who f- felt motivated to do so in large part, 90 plus percent really enjoyed it and liked this sort of increased scrutiny and and team effort and many times participated in more than one study. Once they kind of got hooked on it, so to speak, they continued to participate sometimes early untreated, but then you go on treatment and then there's other things and and do that over time. Uh, And there's also you know, non-interventional, so-called observational research, things like the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, so-called PPMI that the Fox Foundation has. There's a lot of opportunities for people to participate. And sometimes you can do both, you know, be in an observational thing and then do a, a clinical trial also. Perfect. What's the, the typical timing from, you, you said that we're in phase two of studies, of CVN424. In your experience, could you give a sense of if this were to show promising results and actually get approved, what's the timing from about now to when a person with Parkinson's might be able to access this therapy as a as a or this treatment as a um over uh, as a prescribed medication? Yeah, the 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 time arc of drug development is frustratingly long, I would say, for those of us engaged in it, both on the patient and family side and and investigator side. But it's also driven by a concern for protecting safety. Um, Mm -hmm. Long history of things in the past, um, which were not more harmful than helpful, and they were sold for a long time. So there's a reason why there's this long arc And it's about 10 to 15 years from the time a product initially goes into humans to the time it's commercially available for medical care. We're about two, somewhere between halfway and two thirds of the way through that arc. Okay. You know, it's it's been into people, but I would say four to four to where, from where we are right now, it's probably four or five years before it's commercially available. It may become more widely available before it's commercially available to people who participated in the research and so-called open label studies, but commercially available, my guess is something about that time. Okay, that's helpful to know. So I'm gonna ask you a few more detailed questions before we wrap up um, about the sort of the mechanisms of of CBN 424. So we talked about direct and indirect pathways. Can you tell me a little bit about how this particular treatment is thought to work, how it's different from levodopa and why that would be a benefit? Sure, so I spoke before about this nigrostriatal pathway, the, the nerve cells that contain dopamine that project up to the striatum. And then there's these pathways that come back in a circuit and, there's, and I'm using both hands because there's this direct pathway and an indirect pathway that comes back and then uh, influences subsequent neurotransmission, which goes up and drives motor behavior. And in a lot of the brain, there's this balancing act between promoting and inhibiting, sort of push and break. Mm. The direct pathway is the push. It's like the accelerator pedal on making movements happen. The indirect pathway is the braking function, sort of Mm -hmm. stopping movement. When dopamine is working properly, the dopamine transmission is working properly, it stimulates the direct pathway 
and inhibits the indirect pathway. So you push on the accelerator and take the pressure off the brake. That increases movement. And that's what dopamine transmission does. It increases movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm being a little overly simplistic, but sure. Yeah. When the dopamine transmission becomes lower, as in Parkinson's disease, there's less pressure on the accelerator because you've lost that stimulation of the accelerator. And there's more pressure on the brake because you've lost the inhibition of braking. Mm -hmm. So there's too little accelerator and too much brake. This drug works on the braking side to take off the pressure on the brake. It inhibits the brake. Mm -hmm. It doesn't push more on the accelerator, but it takes off the brake because it's only in the indirect pathway. Why would that be helpful? Mm -hmm. Well, we already have a lot of dopaminergic medication, which is already pressing on the accelerator to a certain degree and trying to take pressure off the brake. Everything we do, largely speaking, in Parkinson's disease is trying to promote dopamine transmission. Levodopa gets converted into dopamine. Dopamine agonists act at the receptor for dopamine. MAOB and COMT inhibitors prolong the amount of time dopamine is in the synapse. So everything is pushing on the dopamine system, which means they add up the same complications and problems that you get through mm -hmm. dopamine transmission. One medication works also outside of the direct dopaminergic, and that's estradefeline, which is a adenosine A2 antagonist, so-called Nurians, mm -hmm. um, which is also available. But it's the first drug that's not dopaminer primarily dopaminergic in nature. It works on this adenosine system. So 424 has the opportunity to have a direct anti-Parkinson's action by just taking the pressure off the brake, but not adding to this dopaminergic pressure. So that's how it's different. It's not right on the dopamine pathway, but it's part of the circuit that the dopamine pathway is a piece of. It's just acting in a different piece of that same circuit. That's super helpful. I well, appreciate hopefully it. not overly complicated. I don't think it's, well, for me, it was fairly helpful for my helpful and the, the hand gestures of the circuit. That's that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. You, you Earlier, you touched on deep brain stimulation because of what we were talking about. Is there any relationship between deep brain stimulation and CVN-424? In a sense, yes. Um, in this, in the sense, in the following sense, deep brain stimulation sites in the globus pallidus and in the subthalamic nucleus. Deep brain stimulation, although it's called stimulation, it doesn't. It basically shuts down certain transmission. Again, I'm 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 oversimplifying. If someone or listeners has a good technical knowledge that will understand that I'm oversimplifying, but in many ways, deep brain stimulation, the sites where the electrodes are placed, inhibit those areas, those circuits that are fed by the dopamine transmission. This is kind of similar, but it's a molecular inhibition rather than an electrical inhibition. The sites that are affected, the pallidum, the, the subthalamus, the striatum, they're different, but they're all parts of the same circuit. And it turns out by inhibiting parts of that circuitry, you actually promote movement. And that's what's seen with deep brain stimulation. Although deep brain stimulation, the, the placement of those electrodes also reduces dyskinesias. Mm -hmm. And that's and just and deep brain stimulation candidates have both dyskinesias and uh, an insufficient response to levodopa. So those those all those placements of the deep brain stimulation electrodes are chosen differently than this molecular inhibition to achieve that other aim. But it's similar in the sense that it's surprising that by inhibiting part of the brain, 
you can actually promote movement. But that's true in Parkinson's disease because the brain circuitry is kind of out of balance and it's kind of resetting the balance of the circuitry to be more effective for promoting movement. Carl, as we wrap up here, what most excites you about this trial and this potential therapy? Well, I think it's very interesting that the company has taken this whole approach of trying to find targets we talked about earlier that are uniquely expressed to avoid side effects and unwanted problems. Mm -hmm. And that they seem to have found one, which works in Parkinson's disease. They have a lot of other targets they're working on too for later, but this is the topic of interest now. And that you could have a treatment in Parkinson's disease, which complements the things we do already. Mm -hmm. Um, which might mean we could use dopamine medications to a less degree or use them later. So there's a lot of things that are kind of interesting here because everything so far, you know, you, uh, there's reasons we've focused on dopamine transmission because it works <laughs> and it works quite well, but it is hard to build a truly effective therapy when you're only hitting one part of a pathway. So I think this is uh, an interesting possibility of, of using drugs to treat the other parts of the circuit to achieve a, a more holistic effect. This indirect pathway, by the way, and its braking function is not only braking on movement, but it also breaks on non-motor things. And families and patients with Parkinson's disease will recognize as I used to say with my patients, a lot of your get up and go got up and went. A lot, mm. of, a lot of your drive and interest and fascination with things seems blunted. Mm -hmm. And that's part of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And this drug has the chance to possibly influence that also. So I think that's another exciting feature, the potential non-motor effects here by releasing some of this braking, which is happening both in motor and in non-motor parts of the brain. Perfect. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about this therapy that you'd like to tell our community about, or have we covered everything you were hoping to talk about? I, I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. I think it's a really exciting new development. It's early. Mm -hmm. uh, it's research. Um, but if people are interested, I think it's a really interesting project to, to get engaged in. I'm okay. real happy to be part of it. Wonderful. I'm hopeful that we could come back and have another conversation in a, a year's time or whenever you think it's time to give an update so that folks can hear what's going on and progress towards I'd, the goal. I'd be happy to do that. It would be an exciting time to update things. Terrific. Dr. Carl Kieverts, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, look forward to talking with you in the future. Thank you.